learning. You know, I don't know about you guys, but um, since we've been in this book of Acts, has anybody else noticed how we're beginning to live it? Has anybody else had stuff going on in your life that you go, oh, wait, that's, that's the book of Acts. This, this is how you deal with it. That's the book of Acts. We're going we're gonna to be moving forward in the book of Acts. And so I'm excited over what God has for us in the book of Acts. And um, you guys want to share that with the ladies on Friday night when you go there. Okay. So, um, and how many of you are still doing your writing? Can I see hands of people who are doing writing? Okay. How many of you last week when we mentioned it, you said, oh, I haven't done it, but you started right away? Anybody who started right away? Okay, I saw some hands not raised. So I'm going to tell you this. Start today. Grab your, your sheet. If you don't have one, grab your sheet uh, out there and start today. You don't have to catch up with the whole month of January. You just start today hiding the word of God in your heart, and you just start today with doing what God tells you in his word you hide it in your heart, you write it down, you don't get to type it because we don't, what? We don't remember what we type. And we, when we look up verses, we let our phone look up verses for us. Do we remember where they're at? Do we remember what they say? No, because we haven't had any action toward them. So write it with your hand and have something that you go back to that you open up at a later time, you go, oh, that just ministered to me so much. So you're going to do that. You're going to do it, and you're going to like it, right? Okay. I love the power that this thing brings me. Okay. And so, Father, we are so thankful, Lord, for your presence with us. We are thankful that your Holy Spirit does fill this place, Lord, that you have brought us to this place, that you have loved us with an everlasting love. It is with your loving kindness that you have brought us. Lord, you have filled us to overflowing with a joy unspeakable and full of glory. Father, in the midst of the things that are going on in our lives, we admit Lord, we have a peace that surpasses all understanding that keeps our hearts and our minds in you, Christ Jesus. And Lord, as we look at this uh, chapter in uh, Acts chapter 2, Lord, that you would be glorified, that you would be lifted up, that all men would be drawn to you, that we all eyes would be set on you, that you would receive all the glory and honor that's due to your name. And Father, we just lift up these... Um, I just have to pray for this right now, Lord, in the name of Jesus. We lift up the things that are going on in New York State. Right now, Lord, with this whole abortion thing, Father, in the name of Jesus, we come against that. We stand against it in the name of Jesus. It is demonic in nature. We stand against it. We say, no, this is not going to go on here, Lord. We will continue to pray. We will continue to stand. Father, we pray that you would put a stop to the men's minds that think that this is okay to murder these babies up until the day of their birth, Lord, and even after they are born, after a, an abortion attempt, they let the child die. Lord, we stand against that in the name of Jesus. We stand against it in the name of Jesus. We gather together. We stand against it. In the name of Jesus, we know, Lord, this is not according to your will. We stand together against this abomination, Lord, against our children, against your children, Lord. And we thank you, Father, that you have intervened, and our anger is godly anger, Lord. But, Father, let us in that godly anger remember love and have that peace that you are in complete control. You're in complete control, and we thank you for it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. I am sorry to have gotten on that. It was going to come up later in the thing, but I am just taken aback by the things that I've just read this afternoon. I knew about it, but I read some other things this afternoon. So first, let me clear up something that someone brought to my attention. They were not sure last week when it was, where were the disciples when Jesus breathed the breath of the Holy Spirit, said, uh, receive ye the Holy Spirit. At the time that they were born again, 
Yes, that was during the 40 days when they were in the upper room. That's when that happened. And then they move over to this area that they're in today. They were 40 days there. They are 10 days in the place that we're talking about today. So just wanting to clear that up, it was in the upper room during those 40 days during the time when Jesus was seen by 500 people. He was seen by 500 people. And so I heard somebody talking this week about this particular issue. So now the Spirit is in them, and they are to wait for the Spirit to come upon them, to empower them, to be his witnesses. And I look at that, and Paul says there were 500 people who saw Jesus. And yet we are looking at 120 who are in Jerusalem in this place, only 120 out of that 500, and I'm wondering why. Why is there only 120 out of 500? Were not all 500 invited to go to Jerusalem for the day of Pentecost? Were they not all supposed to be there? I don't know. But there is one thing that it draws my attention to. I have a thought about this. Um, how many of you... It's, a, it, it's too soon for us to have our slide up, but that's okay. It can stay up there because it can stay up for the duration of our study. Okay, that, that's what we're going to talk about when the fire came down. That was the centerpiece for our table this morning. So I, I love that what they do up there. So, um, so what is the smallest meeting in any church? Prayer meeting. Why do you think that is? God's called us to pray with one another. He's called us to do that. Why is the prayer meeting the smallest? I believe that it's because prayer includes a waiting on God, a time of quiet. And I believe that we are terrified of the quiet. We don't know what to do with silence. We, we, we're just, I got to feel it. I got to feel it. I got to say something. Nobody's saying anything. We, we need to be talking. We need to be praying. Yes, sometimes praying is just everybody being quiet and allowing the Lord to speak. And I think that is an area of allowing God to be in control. And I think there are times when a lot of us are uncomfortable with that, with that losing control. And so we're uncomfortable with those prayer meetings. So, um, so it includes waiting on the Lord. These people were told to go to Jerusalem and do what? Wait. I wonder if that's why only 120 came. They were told to go to Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the Holy Spirit. And so there they are in there and... I don't know. Not all 500 could commit to that. Perhaps these, there were only 120 that could do it. And so that is a side note that just is something that's been on my heart, and um, I just wonder about those things. Do you ever pick out things like that, and you're looking at the Word of God, and you just go, how come that's like that? I want to know why that's like that. And, and you guys all do that, don't you? You pick out particular things that you think are not yours, and, and you find it to be deeper than you thought. And so we start with um, verse uh, chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord, and they were all in one place. Pentecost. Pente means 50. It was 50 days after Passover that Pentecost came into play. So let me just go over quickly, and I don't know if it was in your homework. I went quickly over homework, and I tried to read all of your questions so that I can try to be aware of uh, them when I'm teaching. But, you know, I cannot, for the life of me, remember one question that was in those things that I read. So I commend you guys for the way that you answer them and write down things. But um, it may have been in your homework about the different feasts that were going on. So we have the Feast of Passover. We all know that the Feast of Passover was the time that Jesus was sacrificed. The next day would be the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And then the Sunday after the Sabbath after Passover 
was the Feast of First Fruits. And you can see that, you can read about that in Leviticus 23. I want to bring your attention to the fact that Jesus died on the day of Passover. We know that. He was buried during unleavened bread. And he rose on the Feast of First Fruits. He would be the first fruit of all who would rise again, where death could not hold them. So seven Sabbaths take us to the Feast of Pentecost, and now the 50 days are completed. So there were 40 days in the upper room, and now the 10 days in the place where they're at, and now we have the 50 days. Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits were all filled by Jesus Christ. They were all filled by Jesus Christ, and now he's about to fulfill Pentecost as well. And I learned a really interesting thing about the unleavened bread. Have any of you studied what happens during the time of Seder when they take the, uh, the piece of matzah and they um, hide it away? So they break this matzah into three pieces. Interesting. First of all, they break it into three pieces, and they take the middle piece, and they wrap that up in a napkin, and then they hide it. And then uh, the children are allowed to go and look for it, and the one who finds it gets a prize, gets a gift. Little do they know, who is Jesus? He is the second in the Godhead. He's in the middle one. He was dead. He had no sin. He was unleavened. He had no leaven in him. He was without sin. He was wrapped with a napkin on his head, and he was buried, and he rose again when he was, and when he was found, those who found him received a gift, and what they found was a gift of eternal life by finding him. Is that just so cool that the Jews don't even realize that they're doing that? And yet here it is. It's right there in front of them. And so Pentecost here is when the church was born. Pentecost is when the church was born. Pentecost in past was a celebration of the birth of the law. The birth of the law was what Pentecost was the what they were celebrating at this particular time. But in our text, we're going to see that Pentecost here, that's why it was fully come. Pentecost here is going to be when the church was born. When the law came down, you remember when the law came down? Moses came down from the mountain. He has the stone tablets, and he's carrying them down, and he's all proud, and his face is shining and everything. And he comes down, and he sees, what are they doing? There is a golden calf. We have Aaron saying, oh, I threw the gold in. The calf came up. I don't know how that happened. And they are worshiping, and the immorality that was going on, and all of the debauchery that was going on in the length of time that he was up there getting the law. What do we know about the law? The law kills once we know it to be true. The law kills. And what happened that day? 3,000 people died on that day. In our text today, we will find that 3,000 people will come to life. God does that. Pentecost had come to its completion. And suddenly there came. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven, verse 2, as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. First question I want to ask you, what house do you know of in the Jerusalem area that can house 120 people sitting? There isn't one. That gives me an indication they weren't in a particular house, but they were in the house of the Lord. They were in the house of God. They were in the temple. They were actually not in the temple because, remember, there were women with them. And so they would be in the court of the Gentiles. They would be in Solomon's porch. They would be in a place where people could see them, see what they were doing, hear what they were saying. And so here they are, and they have this mighty, as a mighty rushing wind come at them, coming through there. Everybody can see it. Everybody sees what's happening. 
And it's coming through. Remember when in, in John 20, when he breathed into them, he just received the Holy Spirit. Okay, I'm born again with a... This was a... Remember recently, we've had some winds that were trees toppled and poles, uh, uh, electrical poles were uh, broken down and fires were started and all these things from a mighty rushing wind. But what came with this mighty rushing wind? Another thing that came with this mighty rushing wind were clothes of fire over their heads. That reminds me of when Moses was in the wilderness. And remember, he saw that bush, and it was burning, but it wasn't consumed? It was God. It was God. This is the Holy Spirit coming upon them. The interesting thing is that I, if I had those over my head, I would not know that I had them there. But you would look at me and you go, oh, you got, you got fire going on up there. What do I do? We notice when someone else is on fire for the Lord. And it's good that I don't know that I'm on fire for the Lord. That opens up opportunities galore for pride. And we need each other. We need that support of each other. We need to know what is going on in each other's life, and we can encourage one another. Yes, you are strong. You have everything that you need. Yes, you can do this. Look at you. You're on fire for the Lord. You're not just on fire having fun. You're on fire for the Lord. And they could see what was going on. What else was going on? They began to speak in other tongues. Verse 4, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused. They couldn't understand what was going on because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, These are Galileans. They don't, they don't know these languages. How is it that they are speaking these languages and we're hearing them speak in my language? Remember, it, and it goes down here in verses um, from 9 to 11, it tells all the areas that they're coming from. They all spoke in different languages. The farthest one was from Rome, 2,000 miles away, and they were speaking in uh, uh, Roman. What, well? Italian, Italian. <laughs> I knew it. I could see the country there. I just couldn't get the, wouldn't connect here. So this is the picture of, of what it looked like when that fire was on their heads. See, isn't that cute? That's so cute. I want you to notice the people that are in the background. You see the people's faces in the background? And they're, they're uh, what are you doing? What's going on? Okay, so... They hear them speaking in these different languages. When did these different languages come to be? The Tower of Babel. You remember the story. They were going to build a tower that reached up to God. And God says, oh, no, we ain't doing that. No, 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 no. And he confused them. He caused them all to speak in different languages. They couldn't understand each other. And so they have the different languages in different areas as all of this is going on. And so here we have these people all speaking different languages. Now we have disciples, apostles that are speaking languages that they don't know, that they never learned, and they're speaking them in a way that is clear that it's that person's language. They speak it in the correct dialect. They're speaking it in a way that you couldn't tell that that wasn't their native language. Have you ever listened to somebody who's trying to learn a language? Have you ever tried to learn a language? And we all say it with, a, with a, a, an accent, don't we? With an American accent. If we're learning Italian, we learn it with an accent. We have a little bit of an accent. We can't quite get that. Um, and inflection, dialect, is so important, especially if you're speaking Chinese. No kidding. Chinese or any of the um, Oriental or Asian, 
things, they all have an inflection, and the inflection has to be in the appropriate place, or it means something completely different from what you're talking about. So they did it with the right dialect. Where does this come from? They said they're Galileans. How is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? Now, years ago, when Bill and I were just seeing each other, he took me to a, a, an inner city camp. And uh, that night, there was a young girl who had an asthma attack. She um, uh, was taken to the hospital. I was laying in my bed, and I began to think in Spanish. I have never learned Spanish. I have never taken Spanish. I could tell that it was good Spanish. You know, it didn't sound like a <laughs> didn't say like sound like taco or burrito or anything. It sounded like good, good Spanish. And I I haven't done it since. But I remember that. Why would I be thinking in that? I was thinking the wondrous. Thing, wonderful works of God as I was praying for that girl. I didn't need it since then, that particular language, but I was speaking that. That's what they were hearing. They were hearing wonderful works of God. That's what they heard him talking about. And as they were talking about the wonderful works of God, this brings up another thing. If you, I don't know if you are... Um, um, yeah, just lost the word, um, Pentecostal at all. I, I'm, I'm a little bit Pentecostal, as you guys know. But if you've ever been to a meeting where someone spoke in tongues, um, and remember, tongues are not the gift that proves that you have the Holy Spirit. It's not the gift. It is a gift. It's not the gift to prove it. It is proven by an, uh, much more by the way you conduct your life. And so um, if someone gives a word and they give it in tongues and someone says, I have the interpretation of that, and the, big, the person with the interpretation begins to say something like, um, my daughter, I am so pleased with you, and I have these things to say to you, that is not the interpretation of tongues because that is a prophecy. That is speaking to you. That's a horizontal thing. It's speaking to you. When you have uh, in the gift of tongues, an interpretation of tongues would be something like the wonderful works of God. Uh, the the uh, interpretation of the gift of speaking in tongues would be something that is vertical. It's to the Lord. It's talking always about the Lord. The Lord's getting all the glory for it. So the difference in those two things, and I don't want anybody to ever be confused by it. And so they were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, one another, whatever could this be? And others mocked, saying, they are full of new wine. But Peter, verse 14, but Peter, standing up with the eleven, Remember, they were sitting down when this wind came through. Now they're standing up. The 11 are all standing together. They're all standing up together, and we hear Peter raising his voice and saying to them, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words, for these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. That is 9 a.m., how can he say that this gives us another indication that they were in the temple, that they were in the uh, court of the Gentiles, they, they were on Solomon's porch. They were there for morning prayer. Morning prayer is at 9 a.m. No good Jew would ever have anything to eat or to drink before the end of morning prayer. Morning prayer ends at 10 a.m. So they're telling them, we're good Jews. We would not do that. We're not drunk. It's not even 9 o'clock yet. And so, but this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. This is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. I have, I've, I've talked so much, I'm so far behind in my, in my notes here. I'm, I'm just moved right along there. Okay, and so... But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And he goes on to say some words which we will cover. 
when you speak for the Lord, that's why we memorize scripture. That's why we write down scripture. That's why we learn the Bible so that we can say, this is that that was spoken of. Here it says, but this is what was spoken of, uh, spoken by the prophet Joel. I love the King James Version that says, this is that. This is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. And what does he say? And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my, of my spirit on all flesh. I'm going to pour it out. Can you just see with that wind blowing through? It's just like a pouring out. Can you see it just happening? Just pour it out right on all of the disciples and all of the people there on all flesh. I'm going to pour out my spirit on all flesh, on sons and daughters shall, shall prophesy. Young men shall see visions. Old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor and smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. Wait a minute, what happened? Just a, wait, 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 hold it. Stop the truck. What is going on here? We've just had a greatest blessing come through, and he says, this is what was talked about. This is that which was spoken of, that in the last days, these things are going to happen. And this is the beginning of the last days. This is the beginning of the last days. Remember, this is the birth of the church. It is the beginning of the last days. These things will come to pass. The rapture will come to pass. The great tribulation will come to pass. You can read about these things coming to pass in the book of Revelation. But it goes on to say, and it shall come to pass that whoever, whoever, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you look like, what color your hair is, what color your skin is, what nationality you are. It doesn't matter if you're a boy or a girl or a man or a woman. It doesn't matter. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. There is no one that cannot be saved. And so, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, by wonders, by signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. You remember, these things happened. Him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, God sent him. You have taken by lawless hands, you have crucified and you have put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. Who is this talking to? Talking about? This is talking about Jesus. Death could not hold him. Why could death not hold him? Because the wages of sin is death. And he was without sin. He was as the unleavened bread. He was without sin. Death could not hold him. For David, verse 25, says concerning him, and this is uh, Psalm 16, and it's talking about Jesus. I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart rejoiced. My tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope, for you will not leave my soul in Hades nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. His body would not see corruption because of the lack of sin. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day, and his tomb is with us to this day. In Israel, there is still a place where, they, where you can look at and they say, that's where David's tomb is. He is in there. He was dead. He was buried. He was entombed there. Therefore, being a prophet, it says in verse 30, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath 
to him that of the fruit of his body, that is of David's body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. Again, Jesus could not die. Uh, death couldn't hold him. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Guys, you saw this man, is what he's saying. You saw it. We are all witnesses of it. Verse 33, therefore being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. He poured out this Holy Spirit which you are seeing and you are hearing the, what's going on. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says himself, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has, cru has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Who is this saying this? This is Peter. Remember Peter? Peter, the one who says whatever comes to his mind. Peter, the one who blurts out some ridiculous thing. Peter, who does say something that is, you know, uh, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but, you know, you said the right thing right here, and the next thing he turns around and he's being told, Satan, get behind me, because he didn't control what he said. Now, he's number one, he's born again. Number two, now he's been baptized in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has come upon him, and he is speaking with what? He is speaking with power. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and you will see, receive power to become my witnesses. You will have power. You will speak like you have never spoken before. You will have courage that you've never had before. You will have all you need to accomplish whatever God's given you to do. Now, verse 37, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter, and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? What shall we do to be saved? What can we do? What can we do? And what does Peter say to him? The first thing he says to him, you must repent. What is repentance? Repentance is turning around and going in the other direction. It is as if I turned my back to you right now. I went in that direction. That is repentance. I stop going this way, I turn around and start going in the opposite direction. That's repentance. We stop it going in the direction that we know is wrong. Let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's available to every one of you. It's available to every one of us. The gift of the Holy Spirit is available to every single one of us. For the promise is to you, and it's to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And how many has he called? He will call all. He has called all of us to come to him. And I love that it says it's a promise to you and to your children. Now, are your children saved because you're saved? No, I'm sorry. They have to make that choice themselves. But they have a better opportunity of making that choice if we're walking with the Lord. They have to make him his own. And what is that time when they make that choice? What's that age where they make that choice? I don't know. Two of my kids, one was three and one was five. And what does a three-year-old have to repent of? And yet, when she accepted the Lord, there was a change in her life, in a three-year-old's life. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. And so you and your children, you and your household, and all who are far off, that's all us, everyone, Jew, Gentile, man, woman, child, everyone. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. Be saved from this perverse generation that wants to kill our babies up to the day that they are born. And then even after that, and not call it murder. 
be saved from this perverse generation. Come to Jesus. Live for Jesus. Live for something more than yourself. Live for Christ. Let him be your guide. And verse 41, then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about how many? 3,000 were added to the church that day. And they continued. I love this. They continued. The word says, in my Bible, it says steadfastly. I say out loud stubbornly. They continued stubbornly in the apostles' teaching, in their doctrine, and in fellowship, they invested that time with one another, encouraging one another, strengthening each other, coming alongside each other. In the breaking of bread, that is, in communion, he, when Jesus said, every time you do this, you do it in remembrance of me, and in prayers, and in prayers. There is always time for prayer. Prayer. By the way, if anybody's interested, 7 o'clock, on Tuesday mornings, on Wednesday morning, on Thursday morning, on Friday morning, there will be someone here to pray with. If you can come at 7 o'clock in the morning on any of those days and pray, it's, it's just, it is the neatest time. I just, I, I just have, I'm sorry, it's just my fun time. Anyway, then fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common. Now we come to this place, this section. Is this what's required of everyone? Is it required of everyone that I sell everything? No. But this was required of them because this is what the Holy Spirit spoke to them. I've heard it taught they really made a mistake in what they were doing. No. These are people who have just come to know Jesus in a new way. And they are listening. And God told them, I want you to do it this way, and they did it that way. I believe that with all my heart. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common. They sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need, as anyone had need. Remember the word also says, if you don't work, you don't eat. Everybody's working together. You have all things in common, yes, and everybody's, that includes everybody's working together. So continuing, they continued daily with one accord in the temple. That brings me back to the place. They were every day in the temple, those 10 days, every day in the temple. And breaking bread from house to house, this means that they were all eating together uh, at different people's houses, which means they didn't sell their houses. They did, you know, live in houses. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. Gladness and simplicity of heart. Our lives have become so complicated, so complicated, and they accepted it with gladness and with simplicity of heart, with thankfulness of heart, with thankfulness in their hearts. why they lived uncomplicated lives because they knew the peace giver. The gospel is not complicated. And they were praising God and having favor with all the people for a while. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. The Lord added to the church it wasn't the program that added the people. It wasn't the great music that added to the people. It wasn't the great smoke machine or the whatever or the perfect lighting. The Lord added to the church daily. How exciting that is that we are living in a day when God's doing the same thing.
And so, Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your presence with us. I thank you that you have walked us through this. And, Lord, I want you to be glorified in every way, every shape, every form. And, Lord, those who, are, um, who have lost husbands, Lord, we lift them up before you. We ask you to strengthen them and encourage them, Lord. And thank you for walking this through with us. We are privileged to be your children. And we are thankful. And thank you for that gift of the Holy Spirit that makes us, uh, gives us courage to be witnesses for you, Lord. And we thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Giving up, letting go, standing up, stepping out, walking on in the power of your name. I'm giving up. And a presentation of the Heart to Heart Women's Ministry at Refuge Calvary Chapel, Huntington Beach. For more information about this ministry, please visit refugefamily.com or call 714 891 9495.